thank the Lord for what we have and um, thank the Lord for the, really the blood that was shed for the freedoms that we have today. So let's just take a moment of silence. Can we do that? God, we acknowledge that freedom was never free. Thank you for this country that you have given us the privilege of living in. Thank you for the men and the women, Lord, who sacrificed so much for us to have so many things. Jesus, um, still I know that there are repercussions of those who are dealing with the loss of so much. So God, I pray for even those who are still dealing with the loss. I pray, God, that you minister to those places of hurt God, we thank you, and we ask, God, that you would minister to those places still. We love you, and we thank you today. We remember those who gave so much for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Today, uh, I want to take just a few minutes. Uh, we are in our second week of our series on family. Um, you know, before we just go blowing into this, I think it's important that many of you know that I use a preaching calendar. I, I develop it several years ago where I, in the September, I start working on a preaching calendar. And sometimes I think um, it'll feel uh, like, why do you do it then? And how does that connect when it seems so long ago and so far away? And you wonder like, Lord, how can you connect all of those dots from then to now? And you think like, how would the Lord speak from way back then to now? And why would he be talking about family back then when today there's so much going on in the world today? How could that possibly have made any sense, right? You know, I think it's amazing when I stop and look at what God does and why God brings certain people to certain situations. I'm convinced that God doesn't make mistakes. Wow, two of you agree, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well done, church. I will tell you this. Uh, I, I, I know he doesn't make any mistakes. And I know this. I know that God brings people. Um, God has you watching online. God has people around our church who, who brings people for such a time as this. Today, we are in week two in a series on family. And I think with all of my heart, I know it's true that God planned this out for such a time as this. He wants you here to hear this message for you, because you're here. This isn't a message that you get to write the link down to give to someone else for someone else to hear, for them to hear, because doggone it, they need this. This is for you. God wants you to hear this for you. Amen? Amen. We get that, man. Sometimes it's like, you know what? No, no, no. This, I'm writing this down because this, my husband needs to hear this, doggone it. My wife, she, I'm telling you, I'm sending this to my son because they need this in their marriage. Can I, can I tell you this? It might just be for you. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's just for you. How do I know that? Because God's good like that. Amen? Amen. So I want to pray with you, but I want you to say, Jesus, I'm here for me. Can we do that? Jesus, right now, I'm here for me. What do you got for me? I want to receive today for me. What do you got for me, Jesus? Come on, just right now, just between you and him. Lord, what do you got for me? I'm going to receive what you got for me. And I'm going to respond with what you have for me. Have your way, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I always, uh, I, I, when I was the small group pastor um, at a church I was at before, I used to always lead our small groups this way. When they were done, people would always say to me with small groups, and maybe we'll get back to this at some point, with our small groups, they would always say, Pastor, we should always have questions for our small groups. What are the questions for all of our small groups? And they'd always get mad at me, but I would always tell them, you need only two questions for every small group discussion for every night of all time forever. They were like, what are the two questions that every small group should always have all the time? I said, two questions. What's the two questions for every small group discussion? By the way, if you're ever leading a small group and you ever want to start out a small group discussion about everything, here's the two questions you should always have. What's God saying? What am I doing about it? Start small groups with that. What's God saying to you and what are you doing about it? Start with that. 
So here's, here's a thought today. What's God saying to you? Here's a, here's a hint. Maybe you should write something down because I got a funny feeling God's gonna speak to you today. Amen? Amen. Therefore, when Wednesday hits <laughs> or you're at work this week and somebody goes, I don't know, man, did you go to church this week? That's weird. What'd you hear? You can tell them because God's gonna speak to you this morning. But then you're gonna tell them, this is what I'm doing about it. That's for free. <laughs> Here we go. The genesis of family. Why genesis? I'll tell you why in a second. So why does the enemy want, try so hard to redefine family? Why do I say that? Because the enemy tries hard to redefine family. He's been doing it for a long time. Why? Here's why. Because family is the, empow- the single most powerful institution on the planet. It's been that way for a long time, right? The, the family is the single most powerful institution on the planet, um, it is, and I'll tell you why. Because the coaching cardinal rule number one, right? And I say this forever, right? It's the coaching cardinal rule number one. Whatever sport you've ever coached or ever been coached by a coach, I can tell you this. Coaching cardinal rule number one, never change the play that's working, right? If the play's working, don't change the play, right? And I can promise you that, right? In other words, if the play is working, don't change it. So God made a play. The play was, I'm gonna reach the planet through family, it works, but the enemy's play also works. If I can twist and contort the message of family, then I can mess up God's play, right? So he's gonna try, they're both trying real hard, right? Right, so coaching cardinal rule number one, never change the play that's working, right? So God's play was, I'm gonna reach the planet through family because it's the most powerful institution. It's the most powerful institution. It's gonna reach the, the world, God did it through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah. He did everything else. He did it all through family. Mary, how did Jesus come through the planet? He didn't come because he was hatched out of an egg. He came born in a family, right? Jesus was born in family. It was all come through family. I love this, right? So the whole thing is through family. Now I said the word Genesis. Why Genesis? The word Genesis means, at, means this, the origin or coming into the beginning of, or coming into being of something. The genesis of something means a starting point or the beginning. So if we're gonna talk about the genesis of family, let's go back to the beginnings. Let's go back to the very beginning of where family came from. It's important that we do that. It's important we go back to the beginnings of family. Somebody say amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. The purpose of family is twofold. Some of you have heard me say this before and I promise you, you'll hear me say it again. The purpose of family is twofold. Number one, the purpose of family is to form our identity, number one, and number two, to reveal God to the planet, right? Twofold, to form our identity and to to reveal God to the planet. Think about that. The purpose of family is to form our identity and to reveal God to the world. Think about that. Think of the importance of that. The purpose of family is to form your identity. If you were the enemy and you knew that the purpose of family was to form your identity, if you were the enemy, wouldn't you try to twist that? If you knew that the purpose of family was to to form identity in people, wouldn't you try to screw that up? Well, of course you would. If you knew that the purpose of family was to infuse, input, impart identity into people, and you knew that the purpose of family was, okay, um, family's gonna happen, and so a baby's gonna be born, and there's a mom and a dad, and the mom's purpose and the dad's purpose is to input um, identity and purpose into this little person. If the purpose of family is to give identity and purpose into the world, if you knew that that was its purpose, then if you could twist and contort that thing and break it apart, and then have a kid have no identity and no purpose, then wouldn't you? Well, of course. And so what you end up with is an identity, purposeless human being. Ergo, today. Ergo, most of us. Most of us come from broken homes. What happens is, is most of us grew up in broken homes. Most of us with, most of us with, we don't know what our purposes and our identities were because most of our parents didn't know what their purposes and identities were because their parents didn't know what their purposes and identities were because their parents didn't know what their purposes and identities were because their purposes didn't know that all the way back. And so we're like, what, 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 what? We're trying to figure it out. 
In fact, I, I was doing the, Polly and I did the, somebody in our family did the spit in the tube thing, right? And we're trying to figure out what the thing was. And we're like, I, Polly and I couldn't find anyone in our family who like remained married. The love of heaven. We were like, woo, somebody be married and stay that way. Da! We couldn't find any. Like, you know, Polly and I, mar- Polly and our personal family, Polly Lance, looking up our, our line, there's like, between our parents, there's like 10 or 11 different marriages between our parents thing. And we're like, what the? Woo! Woo! Right? We were like, wow, wow, wow. We're beyond that, right? There's a lot, right? And so we're like purposes and identities and halves and steps and steps and halves and half steps and half quarter steps. And we don't even know my word, right? And so we were like, we're trying to figure it. So did you. Don't look at me like that. Our family's just as yours, like, just like yours. Come on now. We're because we're, because the enemy stepped in and screwed us all up. So then Polly and I said, all right, all right, here's the deal. We got one shot at this. Let's try to fix it. So we tried. We're, we're almost, I don't know how many years, I think we're 35 years into this deal. We're trying to figure it out. I think 35, something like that. We're trying, I think, sorry, sorry, hon. She's watching this online right now. She's at home. 35? There we go. So tell us. She's going to text me, I'm sure. So uh, she's at home. Polly's recovering from knee surgery. So. My phone's going to shoot. I'm sorry. Yes, that's 35. I will tell you my phone. Uh, I will tell you, uh, I will tell you this. We, we decided we were going to, we were going to fix it, but I can tell you this. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy doing it the way, the right way. Come on. That's right. Right. I can tell you that it's, it's hard. By the way, I've had people tell me before, um, if you've heard, some of you have heard me say when I've said, I'm not a counselor. As your pastor, I'm not a counselor. But I'm also not a pilot. I'm not a, a chef. I'm not, um, I'm not a lot of things. I'm not a, um, I'm not a medical technician. I'm not a very good caregiver at home. <laughs> the, there's my phone right there. Look, she's calling. Nope, not answering it, hon. Nice try. Uh, I will tell you this, so uh, I will tell you, there's a lot of things um, I'm not, but, but I can tell you that, uh, and, and why, how do I know that I'm not all of those things? Um, because I've been to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, and those guys can make a steak, <laughs> right? I can cook a steak, yeah, that's a pretty good one, I can make a good one, but them, <laughs> right? I, I've been to the hospital, and I know that I'm not I know that I'm not like really, those guys are good, the hospital, right? They know what they're doing. Um, I've been taken care of. Polly is a bang up caregiver. Yeah. She can care give like no one. And how do I know that I'm not a good caregiver? Because she's monster. She's a good one, right? And she tells me that I'm not, but she's, no, <laughs> she's, she doesn't tell me that. She doesn't tell me that. She actually says I'm good. But I'll tell you this, right? I, I can tell you I'm not a counselor because I've been to counseling, I can tell you that I'm not a good counselor because in 2010, we went to 17 months of marriage counseling. You know why? Because we needed it. Amen. So do you. If you breathe and blink and you've been married for eight seconds, you need marriage counseling. Amen. (laughs) If you don't breathe and blink, you need marriage counseling. Because you don't breathe and blink. I mean, you need it. Why? Because you're two human beings and you need marriage counseling. Right? I was, I was, I was telling the last service this. Um, if you walked out these doors and turned to that way, you would see, um, you, you'd see two doors. And there's, a, there's two doors down there, or a door down there. And it used to have a, a sign over it that was our, our counseling, a counseling office. And we used to have counseling down there. If you turned the other direction and head to the end of the hall, my boss's office was down there. And down at the end of the office, there was a seating area where, his, um, where the counseling center's waiting area was, right? And so to get into my boss's office, you'd have to go through the counseling center's waiting area to go into my boss's office. Right, so every Thursday at two thirty or three, I can't remember what it was. I used to, um, I think it was three o'clock. Let's say three o'clock. I used to leave my office at two fifty nine, 
or something like that, one minute before the, the thing, and I would walk all the way around here, and I would go into the counselor's office, um, and because I wanted to avoid my boss, and I didn't want him to know that I was going into counseling, and and he would, um, and then one day the Lord was like, so you're afraid that your boss is going to see you get marriage counseling, and I was like, a little bit, you know, I was having my own thing, right, and so one day I was like, Lance, what are you worried about? So then I literally, no joke, I went over and I said, no, I'm not going to be afraid about this. So I went and sat in the waiting area right outside my boss's office. And wouldn't you know, from that day on, my counseling sessions were always at least 10 minutes late. No joke. And I would sit out there for 10 minutes. And every single time my boss would walk by and he would sit right next to me. And here's what he would say. (laughs) He'd say, you know what? Only the best ones get help. He would just say that to me. He'd go, look, man, the best ones get help. Go get it. And he'd sit there and he'd pray for me. He would laugh with me. He never laughed at me. And he would say, the best ones get help. Go get it. And he helped pay for it. And he said, let's go. And for 17 months, every week, Polly and I went and got help. You know why? Because we're human beings. And so are you. Amen? Amen. We all need help. You know why I know I'm not a good marriage counselor? Because he was amazing. And if you come see me, I'm not. (laughs) I'm like, um, I'm I'm kind of the guy who, if there's an accident on the side of the road, I will say, hey, they need help. (laughs) Right here. They need help. Right here. (laughs) I'll put hands on them and pray. Right here. I'll speak in tongues. I'll pray in tongues over you. I'll do that. I'll even pray some scripture over you. No, come on, I'll, I'll, I'll pray over you, I'll pray, I'll do that, right? I'll lead you, I'll give you some godly advice, but then I'm gonna tell you a phone number, a website, a person, I'm gonna get you to some real help. Come on, because they know what they're doing. Amen. Amen. Go get some real help. Amen. Sorry, let me get back to the sermon. Purpose of family, form your identity and reveal God to the world. Question, what is family as defined in the Bible? Let's see what the Bible says about family. The Genesis of family. Go to Genesis chapter one. Chapter one, verse 26 says this. Then God said, let us make people in our image to be people, uh, to be like ourselves. Remember, this is the Godhead speaking. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit. Look at the Hebrews chapter one says so. It says, they will be masters over all life, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the livestock, wild animals, and the small animals. Look at verse 27. So God created people in his own image. God patterned them after himself, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and he told them, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Be masters over the fish and the birds and the animals. By the way, um, sometimes you read this, and we're a little bit, uh, sometimes we could... You ever have your phone or your iPad and you you take your fingers and you go like this to spread it out to look a little closer? Genesis 1 doesn't do a good job, in my opinion, telling us all the deets of this details. But if you go to Genesis chapter 2, it kind of does that for you. So if you flip over to Genesis chapter 2, you can see a little more details on what that specifically may have looked like when he took Adam's rib and put it inside, made Eve, right? You can see a little bit more details on that. But just for the sake of clarity, listen to this. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 27, if we break this down just a little bit. It said, let us, this is the Godhead speaking, it says, let us create people. It says, we were created in his image. Can we just pause for one second? We were created in God's image. If we just pause long enough to look at this for a second, do you realize that you were created in God's image? Listen, if that doesn't throw you to your knees, I don't know what will. You were created in the image of Almighty God. You weren't hatched. You didn't accidentally happen. You didn't just um, explode out of thin air. You were absolutely designed and created to be an image bearer of Almighty God. There is no other created being on ever that was created to image bear God than you. Duh! 
Do you get that? Nothing was created to bear the image of God but you. Do you see that? There's nothing that was ever created that bears the image of God but you, human. We should be leaping up and down. You are an image bearing. You are created in the very image of God. You get this, not, not your cat or your dog. You. You are an image. Did you know that only an image bearer can create an image bearer? You are, you are an image bearer. You, your job is to bear the image of God. Could you, listen, could you imagine if we believe this stuff? Just for a second, could you imagine if we actually believe this stuff? Seriously, if you left here today and just said, I am created in the very image of God. By the way, in the image of God, um, it's not that you're like a little God. You're not that at all. But you bear his likeness. You, you, you are, you're an image bearer. You bear his image. You're like your daddy. You look at him. You bear his image. That is awesome. His essence. Like you, you bear his image. You're not a tree stump. You're not a rock. You're not like, the, the, you're not a, a table. You're, you're, you bear the image, life. You didn't just happen accidentally. You were designed with purpose. Listen, if, you, if we get a hold of that, that will change you. No wonder the, the planet, no wonder the enemy wants to remove that from truth. Because if he removes that from truth and you become an accidental, evolved, you know, swamp dwelling nothing, then you have nothing to live for because you're just a swamp dwelling nothing and you just evolved out of nothing. Yeah, there's nothing. You just were nothing. So you, you nothing, you're bleh. But if you were created in the very image and likeness of God himself, come on. You bear the image of Almighty God. The value you have. Come on. Nothing in all creation was created in His image but you. Mm. Get this not only in that verse does it say that we were created by Him, but it says He created mankind. By the way, He created them male and female. This was not supposed to be a trick question. Amen. This was not supposed to be difficult. This was not supposed to be um, a, a, a curveball. This was supposed to be super easy. And if I, if I keep talking, I'll get us into a big mess right now. I'm just going to tell you. I'll just tell you. It's supposed to be super easy. Amen? Amen? So I'm going to move along. I'm telling you. Male and female. Not or, but male and female. Okay, sorry, let's move along. Get this, conclusion. Now, by the way, it says, number three, God blessed them. He created them, he, he made them male and female, and then he blessed them. Amen. Get this, conclusion is, he created them, designed them, and he blessed them. Right, I love this. Each designed, God's original plan was that he, he created them, designed them, he blessed them, so that when he established them in family, that they would reveal God to the world. Yay. So let's go. Let's reveal God to the planet. That should be awesome, right? The problem is, the problem is, family's broken. The problem is family's broken. It didn't, didn't work like it was supposed to. Here's the thing. It's broken. It's broken. It didn't work like it was supposed to. Not because God, but because of us. Last service, I was like, I said, you know what? The problem with family is that it's broken. And I saw elbows are flying. Yeah, it's broken because of you. And you. Truth is, it's broken, right? And I can tell you this, it's probably broken because of them, right? But here's the thing. The, the truth is, if we all agree with it, you, um, I can tell you this, because of the counseling, all the years of counseling that we went, all the months of counseling, I can tell you this, um, because if you try to fix the person next to you, we call that, I found out, they call it codependence, right? And I was told that because I read a book called Codependence No More, because I found out I was codependent because I kept on trying to fix people. Um, you can't fix people. But here's what I did find out. You can't fix anyone else but yourself. 
So here's what I did find out. Your church today, all you can fix is you, right? So you can't send this link to anyone else. You can't send this sermon to anyone else. You came here, it's your fault. Today, it's all about you. <laughs> Amen? This sermon's for you, right? So you got here today. Jesus is gonna speak to you, so this is all about you. You're the broken one. You broken you. You brought broken you into your, ha- your family. All you can fix is you today, brother. All you get is you. All you can do is fix you. You can't fix broken him or her, even though it's their fault, right? You can't. You want to tell you, say, man, it's all my dad's fault. It's all my mom's fault. It's all, they're all that. You know what? Let's blame them. It's all their fault. It's all their fault. But you know what? Here's the deal. All you got is you. Just fix you today, right? Let's just deal with me today, right? That's one thing I realize is all you got is you. Fix broken you. All right. Here we go. Remember, you bring you into your family. So open your Bibles real quickly to to Philippians. So we're getting out of Genesis right now. We're going to go to Philippians. Philippians is the the epistle of joy, right? And this is all kinds of fun. We're going to talk about fixing broken you. The problem with our broken families is this. I think most of the brokenness in our families is between our ears. I think there's so much of our brokenness that's stuck between our ears. I think we have broken thinkers. I think there's real brokenness in all the other areas, but in a lot of ways, our broken thinkers aren't helping us at all, right? And I'll tell you, I'll put it this way. Philippians is a really great book because in a lot of ways, Philippians is all about thinking, right? Um, and again, Philippians is amazing because in so many places, it's about joy, Right Now think about this, Philippians being about joy, 19 times Paul references being joyful in Philippians. Be joyful, be joyful, be joyful. And you might think to yourself like, well, of course, it's in the Bible. It should be about joyfulness, right? So the suck part about Philippians is this, is that Paul writes this from a Roman prison being chained between a couple of guards, writing about being joyful. He says, be joyful. And again, I say Rejoice. And we're like, seriously, Paul, right? I will tell you this right now. Paul's circumstances didn't determine his joy. Paul determined his joy outside of his circumstances. What I'm telling you is this. I think in a lot of ways, Philippians is all about active thinking, not passive feeling. I think in a lot of ways, your situation that you grew up in is not fair. And all too often, if you knew the scenario I grew up in in my family, it wasn't good. It was bad. There's a lot of things that were terrible about it. And it was, it was horrible. And there's things that I wouldn't wish upon any of you. But I'll tell you this, in a lot of ways, active thinking, I just, sometimes I felt my way through life and I felt terrible. I felt neglected. I felt hurt. I felt, I felt bad. I felt, I felt, I felt, I felt, I felt. In so many ways, there were times I wished I could just think differently. I think in a lot of ways, we, we have to learn how to think differently. And I'm not trying to Joel Osteen us way through anything. And I'm not saying him whatever his thing is. I'm just saying sometimes we can positively think our way through. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm saying sometimes we've just got to change the way we think. By the way, get this. Uh, In your Bibles, Romans 12. um, Give your Bibles. Romans 12 says this. I don't have it on the screens. So just look, listen real quick. Romans 12, 2 says this. Um, This is the New Living Translation. It's written at a sixth grade level. On purpose, this is the devotional. This is what I read to read my devotions in. It's under highlighted in blue. This is in my Bible. Um, I, I read this for my personal devotions, sixth grade level. Why? Because I get it, right? Um, so you can use your own devotions, but I can tell you this. It's highlighted in Romans chapter 12, verse two. Here's what it says. But let God, this is what it says in my Bible. By the way, it says in yours too. Let God transform you into a new person. How many of you would want to be a new person at some point? Here's what I realized. God can transform me into a new person. The Lord knows I've tried to transform myself into a new person. And here's the deal. You know what? You know what? Every time I've tried to transform myself into a new person, I sucketh. I've tried. I've tried hard to transform myself into a new person. I'm terrible at it. No, it doesn't work. But I can tell you this. It says, let God. I'm going to let God transform me into a new person. Here's how. But let God transform you into a new person. Here's how. By changing the way you think. What? Here's what it says. Romans 12, 2. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Wait a minute. So if I change how I think, then God will do the transforming? That's awesome. 
So I change how I think, God, God will change how, who I am. If God changes who I am, then maybe he'll change how I feel. So I don't have to change my feelings. I just get to change how I think and God will change how I feel. What in the world? I change how I think. God changes how I feel. And wait a sec. All I got to do is change how I think. And then God's going to eventually change how I feel. That's awesome. See, we drive the train the other direction. and We try to change how we feel. All we do is try to, we feel our way through life. I don't feel good about it. I feel bad. I feel terrible. I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. What if we just changed how we think? Maybe that's the, maybe we're driving the train in the wrong direction. All right. Here we go. Philippians is about active, listen to this. Philippians is all about active thinking, not passive feeling. Far too many of our lives, far too many of us live life in our families today actively feeling and passively thinking. We actively feeling and passively thinking. We just actively feel. I feel ignored. I feel, I, I feel pushed aside. And maybe that's true. Maybe there's a lot of us if that's true. But we actively are just feeling all the time. And I'm just saying to us, maybe we just should slow down. I think we have some broken thinkers. So let's go here. Go over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Go down to verse 9. How to fix your broken thinker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out of the message translation of the Bible. I don't think it's the greatest translation. It's, it's called a transliteration. This is, um, is going to talk about the actual translation. So there's good translations. Then there's a transliteration, which is talking about what the translation is. I love how it's put this way. To fix your thinker, listen to this. To, listen to what, we have to put our feelings to the test. There's a good way to test your feelings. Philippians 1.9. It says this. This is what the message translation says. So this is my prayer, listen to this, that you love, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, listen to this, but that you will love well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head to test your feelings. Wait, just let me read that one more time. You need to use your head to test your feelings. Hang on, for all the teenagers in the room, let me say it one more time. You need to use your head to test your feelings. Hang on, for all the rest of you guys in the room, let me read it one more time. I'm saying that to all of us, we're gonna use our head to test our feelings because the world that we're living in right now says, no, no, you don't need to use your head to test your feelings, you just need to trust your feelings. Right. See, maybe we got it all backwards. We say to all the time, let your feelings prove your head. How you feel determines the truth. How you feel determines everything. How you feel determines the identity. What? Let that one sit for a sec. Use your head to test your feelings. Verse 10, so that your love is sincere and intelligent and not sentimental gush. Yeah. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus would be proud of. Verse 11, bountiful in fruits from, soul, from the soul-making Jesus Christ, attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God, come on. Sentimental gush. We don't say that enough in church. <laughs> circumspectly. I love that word. The word circumspectly actually means to carefully consider all circumstances, all possible consequences, to move in a way that is careful and avoids risk. Listen, to love correctly with your head and not your heart first, can I just tell you this? It takes a lot of work. It's not a joke, man. This, this loving correctly, this loving circumspectly thing, it's a lot of work. It's a hard thing because it's absolutely swimming upstream in the context of our culture. It's a, it's a, it's a wow. It's paddling upstream and you don't, got a, you don't got a motor, man. It's you and a paddle. And you're just rowing as fast as you can because the, the current is going the other direction. Come on. That's right. 
right? And everything inside of you and everything around you is saying, nope, feel it your way and go the other way. We, 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 in the 80s, man, we grew up in the have it your way culture, right? We just, whatever you decide, you get to do, right? And then it only has been worse since then, right? And then it's gotten heated up, heated up and salt and pepper and everything else around it since, right? Now, I, 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 wanna, I wanna just take us now down a road that I feel like we're supposed to go for this because I want to I help you this. Um, about 20 years ago, I, I went to my favorite restaurant. Um, it was in Ording, um, the Park Bench Cafe. I went to the Park Bench Cafe. Uh, I sat out there. Um, I, I know now that I'm not a marriage counselor. Then I didn't know I wasn't a marriage counselor. Um, and so a young couple came to me and they said, hey, um, one, the wife said, hey, we're having problems. Um, my husband wants to get a divorce. And I was like, he. I don't, what do you mean? And so he wants to get a divorce. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. I was a new pastor. And I was like, I didn't know what to do, honestly. I was young, I was in my 20s. And I was like, ah, he, well, he should get some counseling. And she said, he, he didn't want to get counseling. And so I was like, uh, tell him he needs to get divorce counseling. I don't even know that exists. I just made it up. And so he, she's like, I don't, what's that? And I was like, I don't know ask him if he'll do that. And she's like, he said he'll do that. And I was like, okay, I just wanted to get in his presence so that I could talk to him. And make, so I thought maybe I could talk him out of it. And honestly, I, I was just shooting from the hip because I was like, I just want to talk to the guy and find out like where he's at. And so we sat outside in the front of the park bench and I was like, okay, so we're at this little table, she and me and him. And I was like, okay, so uh, what? what? And, he, and she's like, I don't want to get divorced. I love him and whatever. And then I was like, what about you? And, and he's like, I don't want to. And I was like, no, wait. Like, what do you mean you don't want to? And she, he's like, I don't want to. And, and, and by the way, let me just let's pause for a second and tell you this. Sometimes people have this idea that, that love and hate are opposite ends of a spectrum. Like we think love is here and hate is here. And, and um, I've done enough counseling to tell you that's not true. That love and hate are not opposite ends. More often than not, love and hate are like this. Like they're back to back. They're, if there's a hate and love, there's actually hope. <laughs> because I, I don't like you means like I care enough about you to give you an emotion, right? Um, um, indifference is a problem. Indifference when you just don't care, that, that's a problem, right? And so what I found was, as I talked to this couple, um, she was in trying to figure it out. He was way over here with, I don't, I don't really care. And so I was like, I'd never bumped into indifference in a marriage before. And as a young person, I was like, I don't know what to do with that. And so he was like super indifferent. And he was like, I don't know, you can have the car, you can have the boat, you can have the kids, I don't really care. And so I was like, wow, can we talk, can we do? And he's like, I don't, whatever, I don't really care. And I was like, no, 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 you give me something. And I spent probably all the time that we were talking with this person who didn't care. And so I got to thinking as I was preparing this message that maybe somebody here today might be dealing with indifference. It might be indifference in your marriage. Maybe it's indifference into your family of origin. In fact, some of you might even be feeling indifference towards your parents or towards a sibling. You've lost hate. You've forgotten hate. Hate doesn't even exist anymore, but it's turned into indifference. It's gotten to the point where you just don't care. That's a scary place. And I'm here to tell you, as I was like, Lord, seriously, you want to talk about indifference at church today? What if there's only one person it matters to? And he's like, well, I think you should talk about it, Lance. And I was like, seriously, we were going to talk about families. And, but all right. And so I, I'm just going to talk about it for a second. So can I just, for the last couple of minutes, talk to you about how to re recover from indifference? Because maybe you're there today. H how do you recover from indifference? Right? H how do you do that? Indifference is the lack of interest or concern, non-importance, little or no concern. Philippians 3.1 says this. Whatever happens, dear brothers and sisters, may the Lord give you joy. I never get tired of telling you this. I'm doing this for your own good. If you want to move past indifference, the first thing Paul says is to rejoice in the Lord. 
right? It sounds so weird, but let me tell you this. If you're in a place where you're like, I, like, I don't care about my dad. I was hurt by him. I was hurt by my mom. I was hurt by my whatever it was. And it's turned from hate to I don't really care. And you've left, you've left hate and pain to just I don't really care. Can I just tell you this? Um, those are places where the enemy can really set up camp in your heart. And I, I don't want that to happen in you. Because those are wedges, those are gaps where the enemy comes and sets a root. And in, in order for that to get taken out, indifference has to leave. And, and so right now, maybe that's you today. And so if you want to recover from indifference, the first thing that needs to happen is joy needs to return. Not happy, not giddy, not woohoo. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. In the middle of his situation, in the middle of his being chained between two guards, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. It's interesting because in this scenario, it's impossible to be indifferent when you're rejoicing, by the way. What keeps us from rejoicing oftentimes is what I call the uns of life. What keeps you from rejoicing are the uns of life. I don't know if you realize that, but the uns the unsatisfied, the unresolved, the unconfessed. It's usually the uns that keep you from rejoying, right? So the unsatisfied expectations, you thought your marriage would be this, you thought your finances would be that, you thought your career would be this. The uns of life, those things keep you from rejoicing, right? So the unresolved conflicts, those things keep you from the ruptures in your marriage, those things keep you from rejoying, the unconfessed sin, those things keep you from rejoying. The secret of rejoying can be simply confessing that sin. Saying, Jesus, will you forgive me? Will you, will you forgive me? I, I need you to take away that sin. The Bible says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to purify you. Right? The secret of saying, Jesus, I need you to take away that place in my life and give me purity, right? Is to say, Jesus, I confess, your, I confess this sin to you. I need you to fill me with your purity, right? So sometimes the unconfessed sin, the uns of life can get you from living in the joy, right? And not that, like I said, I don't want, it's, it's not about just being giddy. It's about joying, Paul's talking about, right? So in order for us to move past indifference, we need to rejoice in the Lord. Number two, to walk, move past indifference, we need to fix our thoughts. It's interesting. Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts. I love this. It's the word legizomai in the Greek. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. I love this. Literally, he's saying this. Paul is saying, if we're going to move past indifference, we have to make a decision on what is true. The word legizomai is where we get the word legitimate. It legitimize, it means to fix, it means to set in concrete some true things, right? I know in my brain, um, sometimes I have to, um, when, I, I, I used to say this all the time, when, when, uh, when my world would go weird, I, there, when my brain, sometimes I'd get super tired or emotional, I, I used to say there, there were three things in my life that were absolutely true all the time, and, and it's the truth, I used to, these three things, hopefully I can remember them, um, it's been a while, but I used to say all the time, Polly, um, there, were, there were three things that were absolutely true. I called them my default modes. Like uh, my default modes were this. Um, Polly thinks I'm handsome. My kids think I'm Superman. And Jesus loves me, this I know. Right, those were three things I knew for sure, 100%. Polly thinks I'm handsome. My kids think I'm Superman and Jesus loves me, right? And I knew that that was 100% true all the time. There was nothing that could take away that, right? I don't know why she liked me, but somehow Polly just thought I was handsome. And I was like, well, I fooled her, but there we go. And my kids, they just always thought I could do anything. I don't know why. They just, felt, they just figured I could figure my way out of anything. Like, you didn't know what it was, but it was a cardboard box. They thought I could make, a, they just, you know, it's like if you're a dad, they think you can do anything. And, and, I, they, and Jesus loved me. And I was like, hey, man, that was my default mode. That was 100% legit, so my, that was legitimate. And I, I just remember those three things. Those were legitimately true. And when the world was going ape nuts crazy, those things didn't change. I don't care what you thought of me, but those things didn't change. Because Polly thought I was cute, kids thought I was Superman, and Jesus loved me. You guys could think I'm a goofball. 
But I just thought, nope, those things didn't change. They were legitimately true in my world. And there, you got those things in your life? You got something in your life that's 100% true? You get some. Those are legit to my, to me. They were mine. All right. Listen, the truth is, if you don't determine your thoughts, your thoughts will determine you all the time. Right? Number three, move past indifference. You need to rejoice in the Lord, fix your thoughts, and then boast in Christ's goodness. I love this. It's actually where the word boast out of there actually is where we get the word worship. It's, it's the word um, kahalomai. Actually, it's where we get the word rely or worship. It's where we get the word worship from, where it says to boast in the Lord, to worship in the Lord. And finally, number four, to move past indifference, refocus your attention, Philippians 3, 12 and 13. Refocus your eyes on the Lord. In other words, you have to choose to focus your eyes on Jesus. I didn't read all that scripture, so sorry about that. But you have to choose to focus. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved this, Paul says, but these things I, or have already um, reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus has possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus, I press on to this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I focus, Paul says. Listen, some of you have come from tremendous pain. If family is the most powerful institution on the planet, I can tell you it's also the source of great pain. And I know that I step on, I walk on landmines as I walk through this series on family. I know it because I can see it on your faces. I know that I touch on things and I, I see your arms clinch and I see your faces grimace you should see from my vantage point as I look at you. And I know some of you smile through gritted teeth. I see it and I feel it. And I can tell you this, I'm proud of you. Jesus is healing you, but you gotta let him. As I pastor you, there's reasons I tell you what I told you at the very beginning. God brought you here on purpose. I said that on purpose because I think he brought you here on purpose. You didn't get in here on accident. He wants you to hear this word. He wants to restore broken you. This word ain't for someone else, it's for you. So Jesus, today we come. We thank you. Thank you that you're so good. You are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. <clears throat> Go to those places in each of our hearts. To some that have been years of pain, years of misunderstanding, years of hurt years of I'll never let somebody get there will you just do you will you just do what you do good Lord you are a healer will you do what you do Lord you bring the healing you're so good Father I pray that you do what you do best you are our healer Father, I ask that you go to those places that only you can go. Bring the healing and the hope and, and all the things that you do to the, to, to the little person inside of each of us or maybe even the, the broken marriage that is, that, that is inside of us. And maybe some of us who were the result of the broken marriage or the recipient of the broken marriage. You're good, God. There's all kinds of stuff represented in a room like this or watching online. You're just good. So Father, have your way. You're good. Help us to take a step from here and learn to trust you in the process. You are our gentle healer. Help us to become one, I don't know, one step closer, one step better, one step more healed. I don't know how you describe it, but just better. 
because we need you. We love you. Thanks for bringing me here this morning. You're good. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, amen. amen. That's good. Well, I'm glad you're here. You glad you're here? Yeah? Ah, I love it. All right. So some of you are like, I'm letting someone else listen to this. You know, whatever, it's up to you. But I'll tell you this, I'm glad you're here. Uh, listen, stand to your, I hope you have a great afternoon. I hope you have a great day tomorrow. Enjoy, um, be careful. Why don't you stand to your feet? Listen, if you need prayer today for you or those wounds inside of you, we have people who are here at the sides to pray over you. If you need to receive Christ or rededicate your life to Christ, some people at the sides are coming up forward and they'll pray for you as well. Don't miss this opportunity to be prayed for. Can we please do that for you? God bless you today. Give someone a hug before you leave today. Be encouraged.